Welcome to week nine for hematology. So we are going to just go over one lecture PowerPoint today, which is probably a relief to us that we just have one chapter this week. Um, so let's go ahead and just get into that. Let me share my screen here and I will bring up the PowerPoint. So it's going to be chapter 25, again, old edition, it was chapter 24, but essentially chapter 25 is now the new edition number. But at any rate, the title of the chapter is Extra Corpuscular Defects Leading to Increased Red Blood Cell Destruction, Non-Immune Causes. My gosh, that is a long title. So what that basically means is extra corpuscular meaning there's going to be hemolysis, which is the increased red cell destruction due to something outside of the cell. Last week, we had a chapter on intracorpuscular defects, meaning something within the cell itself was abnormal, like a protein or something. This week, it's all about something else is targeting those cells and destroying them. And it's not due to an antibody. That just means by non-immune, no antibody involvement on this. Next week, we will have a chapter where there is antibody involvement, but this week, none. So with that being said, still on the topic of hemolysis. So everything in here will be a hemolytic process. So our first topic is going to be the MAHA group and it stands for microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So microangiopathic is referring to your smaller blood vessels, such as your capillaries, things like that. So they're kind of not like your main veins and arteries, but more of the smaller areas, especially. So it is a hemolytic anemia, and it's actually a group of disorders that reside within this topic, within the MAHA group. So not just one, but a group of disorders. And all of them have similarities in that they all have red blood cell fragmentation inside the circulation resulting in intravascular hemolysis. So all of this is taking place in the arterioles and capillaries. There will get to be these fibrin deposits, or if you want to call them fibrin clots inside those arterioles and capillaries. And as red cells try to pass through, those fibrin clots shred those red cells, and that's where the intravascular hemolysis comes about. And again, the key finding you're gonna see is schistocytes, those fragmented pieces of red cell after they kind of get shredded trying to get through the fibrin clots. So that is the principle of what MAHA means. So the disorders that can reside within the MAHA group is um, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, otherwise known as TTP and HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS. Those are probably the two main disorders, but we can definitely see this type of process in other things like sepsis, DIC, that's a big, big thing to, um, that we're gonna learn. Transplants, complications of kidney, or kidneys, of pregnancies, all of these could also result in this kind of process happening. So we are gonna first talk about TTP, that thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So again, looking at the title, thrombotic stands for clots. Thrombocytopenia means low platelet count and purpura is basically kind of a sign of low platelet count. It's like a hemorrhage, little hemorrhage points at the skin. There are little um, different sized hemorrhages on the skin showing that you're low in platelets. So that's what the name means. So we know it involves clots. We know you're gonna have a low platelet count. We know that just by the name alone. So again, because this is a type of MAHA, these clots, these thrombosis occlusions are residing again in the arterioles and capillaries. So it will create that hemolysis process as the red cells try to pass through. It will shred them. You also will see a low platelet count. And then some other unique features here, a neurologic dysfunction, fever and renal failure all can be seen as part of the TTP. Um, it is a pretty rare disease, but I do ask that you know this, and we're gonna revisit this disease when we get to coagulation units at the end of HEME 2, so you'll see it come back up at that point as well. All right, so to diagnose it, again, you're gonna see a low platelet count, less than 20. You'll see lots of schistocytes, helmet cells. All of those are really good signs of intravascular hemolysis occurring. You'll see the anemia part go along here, increased reticulocytes and nuclear red cells. Again, that's just your bone marrow trying to replace the cells that were destroyed, just kicking out more cells to replace those. And we always see a high retic count in any type of hemolysis. So all of this kind of goes with it. Um, treatment, most are cured with plasma replacement therapy. We're not gonna get into the whole hows and whys, there's like a gene that's associated with this that can mutate 
I'm not going to make you learn that gene or anything, but you might hear of it down the road or you might read it in your textbook. We won't test on that depth of it. I just want you to recognize that this is a type of maha, what it needs to be a maha, and that the key signs of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, TTP, is low platelet count, renal failure, neurologic abnormalities, and then, of course, thrombosis, those thrombotic occlusions in the smaller blood vessels. All right, HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, very similar to TTP in that, again, it's a type of maha. You have low platelet counts. You have thrombocytopenia. You have renal failure, but the severity of the renal failure is much more in HUS than in TTP. So it's much more severe renal failure in HUS. And if you look at the name, HUS, uremia, that middle word, if you haven't been through chemistry, you might not know this, but if you've been through clinical chemistry, maybe you've heard of uremia. Uremia means a failure of all three main systems of your kidneys. It's a very severe renal failure, in other words. So the word itself is telling you how significant that renal failure is. And so that will separate HUS from TTP in that the renal failure is much more severe. The other thing that will separate the two is that TTP involves neurologic symptoms. HUS does not. And then what causes it? So TTP was a lot due with like a gene mutation and stuff that you can read about in your book. HUS is more like it comes about from toxins that are produced from different um, bacterial food poisoning. If you were to eat something that is raw and you get E. coli 157 or Shigella is another one that does it these food poisoning bacteria and they release toxins, that toxins result in the HUS kind of happening. So that's where it kind of comes about. It's really linked with toxins by bacteria. All right, so with HUS, that main target is the renal capillary endothelium. That's why the renal failure is so severe. It's targeting kind of the kidneys. And so these fibrin and deposits, because remember, it's a maha, so you get Fibrin deposits built up in the arterioles and capillaries, and if it's targeting the kidney capillaries, you know, especially, you're going to damage the glomerulus, which results in renal failure. So that's where the severe renal comes in, and that's how it links back to being a maha. The fibrin deposits are specifically in the kidney capillaries. So sun and signs are going to be acute renal failure, intravascular hemolysis, abdominal pain with vomiting. Well, that kind of goes with the food poisoning bit with the toxins and bacteria, especially in children. Um, but again, very similar to TTP, but the renal failure and then the lack of neurologic abnormalities will separate it out. All right, so there's the diagnosis. Of course, you'll see the intravascular hemolysis signs like hemoglobinuria, hemoglobinemia, and hemocytorinuria. You'll have the low platelet count. And the urine part at the very bottom is showing you some things that you would find in renal failure. You don't have to be an expert on that. This is not your analysis class, so don't worry about it. If you don't know what those end items are, I'm not testing you on those last couple bullet points. You'll learn them again in the future. So we, we, will, get, we will cover them eventually, just not today. All right, another type of MAHA where we can see MAHA type things occurring is malignant hypertension. So in other words, a high blood pressure, if you will. So we see red cells being destroyed from fibrin deposits, again, in arterioles, because it is a maha. When they bring the hypertension back under control and back to normal, then the hemolysis kind of disappears. So the hypertension is the cause of the red cell fragmentation in this case. I'm not testing you on this. This was just informational. So if you don't want to worry about the slide, cross it off. All right, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, is something that's important. We will talk about it here, and we will also revisit this again in the coagulation unit in the end of HEAN2. So DIC is very much seen with MAHA types. What happens in DIC is that basically it never occurs on its own. It always is secondary to something else that that patient has going on. So if you skip to the last bullet point here, it talks about that it accompanies many systemic disorders like pregnancy complications, snake bites, heat stroke, severe infections like sepsis where it's an all over body infection, you know, kind of getting in the bloodstream. All of those can result in a DIC happening with it. So what I want to kind of emphasize is DIC is never a disease somebody has on its own. They have something else going on inside their body and whatever they have going on puts them into this condition. 
A lot of times this is linked with leukemias as well. So just kind of giving you some perspective. So where it comes in with the MAHA stuff, with the red cell fragmentation is what happens in DAC is they're making little clots throughout your body in these microcirculation, like your capillaries or arterials. So you have these little clots, but they're making a lot of them. All of a sudden, you're using up all your coagulation factors and proteins, your platelets are used up, everything is getting used up making all these little clots throughout the body in the circulation. And so, oh, that's the only side I had on it. But basically, what happens is that when you go to like try to clot or if you cut or something happens, you basically have used up everything in your body to clot that now you're hemorrhage out, you bleed out. And it's a severe, severe situation. It's an emergency type situation, not taken lightly, very deadly, it, you know, because they're small clots to begin with, you don't detect them right away. They're not kind of that noticeable, they're smaller, they're not as harmful, but when you build up enough of them and you've used up everything you know to stop you from bleeding, then you bleed out. So that's the big severity with the IC. It is part of the MAHA because again, it's small, it's clots in smaller circulation, shredding your red cells, and then it results in a really significant hemorrhage situation. So we will learn a lot more on DIC at the end of Heme 2, but I do want you to keep it in perspective with the MAHA group. All right, disseminated carcinoma. This is referring to complications of different cancers. Um, it could be several different cancers that would put you into a hemolytic anemia, MAHA type situation. So again, same kind of principle here. So we're not gonna worry too much on this one. You can skip it if you will, or read through it if you like. Traumatic cardiac hemolytic anemia. So this is a type of hemolytic anemia. This is, now we're kind of getting outside of the MAHA group. We're not so much in the MAHA group anymore, just to keep that in mind. So now we're just getting to other things that are gonna cause intravascular hemolysis. So in this case, we see anemia due to fragmentation of red cells because of high shear stress on a foreign surface. So a lot of times if somebody gets like a different prosthetic heart valve or an aortic valve replacement, that is a foreign surface in your body. And you can get red cells fragmentate on that surface of that foreign object. So that would result in the intravascular hemolysis. And then with intravascular hemolysis, you're gonna see all the same type of signs. Helmet cell schistocytes, increased retic count, hemoglobinuria, hemoglobinemia, hemosiderinuria, low haptoglobin, increased LDH and bilirubin. Those are all classic, classic findings of any intravascular hemolysis. March hemoglobinuria, this is kind of a neat one um, in that it's named for marching, for when soldiers used to march, you know, and they would have long marches where it's constant impact of their feet on a hard surface continuously. Um, we could see this in, obviously, soldiers don't march like that anymore, but if you think of, you know, any Anybody that's doing strenuous exercise where their feet are constantly hitting the pavement, think of like marathon runners, they would result in something like this, or they could, not to say they always do, but marathon runners would be a good um, kind of example here. So they result in an intravascular hemolysis where they're going to see, you know, bloody urine, hemoglobinuria, hemoglobinemia, uh, so that intravascular hemolysis signs due to that strenuous exercise and that repeated impact. Um, on it. So after their strenuous exercise, they may pass red urine as a result. If they stop the strenuous exercise, it should go away. Simple as that. So it is truly named for the reason behind it. All right, now getting into malaria, we will definitely need to know malaria. And malaria is one of those things that, yes, it is a parasite, so you're probably thinking we should learn this in microbiology, but um, I actually teach both courses, um, so I prefer to teach malaria in hematology. So when we get to micro, we're not going to focus really much when we get to the parasites on malaria. We'll bring it back up, but we're not going to focus on malaria in the parasitology unit because we have a ton more parasites to learn than that. So we are going to mainly learn it here in hematology, and the reason we do is because it directly ties in with hemolytic anemias. It's what happens in the body with malaria. So malaria will infect the red cells. It is a parasite that targets and infects the red cells, and then when it's done using that red cell, it lyses them. 
And so that's where the hemolytic anemia part comes in. It will continue to lyse your red cells after it's done with each one of them. So, of course, malaria, I think we're all aware it's transmitted by a mosquito, but it's transmitted by a specific genus of mosquito called the Anopheles mosquito. We do not have this type of mosquito here in the U.S., so we don't have malaria here. But you will still see malaria show up when you work in a lab, and that is because we have a lot of people that travel nowadays, a lot of people that move around the world. So if anybody comes in from any sort of uh, malaria endemic area, which could be, of course, Africa or the southern part of Asia, you know, Middle East, any part that might have malaria and they travel back and forth or they moved or whatever it might be, they could present with malaria. We see it. My friend who works in northern Minnesota in the lab, they had it just like two years ago. I had a student that went to the North Dakota State Department of Health for her microbiology rotation and she saw it there. So yeah, you do see it. We still need to be aware of it, even though we don't have the mosquitoes here in the U.S. that carry it, we see people with it when they come um, from their traveling or whatever they have done. So transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito, it also can definitely be transmitted by any blood product. So they very much screen all blood transfusion products now from malaria. So when you go join a blood, your unit of blood is getting screened for all sorts of diseases, malaria included. All right, so with that being said, you have to know the life cycle of malaria. So we are going to walk through the steps of the life cycle, and I need you to know these life cycle steps in order and be able to do these on an exam or quiz. All right, so to begin with, you're going to notice some different terms here. Um, and it's okay if we don't understand the terms to the point. I'll try to reference it to make it understandable. But essentially, when the mosquito bites you, it will inject what they call sporozoids. It's the form of the malarial um, parasite. It's a stage of that parasite. It will inject those sporozoids into the human, and it can be one of four species. There's actually four species of the parasite. I'll start with Plasmodium. So it's Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium malariae, Plasmodium falciparum, or Plasmodium ovale. Those are the four different types of malaria that you may get after that mosquito bites you. So once it injects one of those malaria into you, they right away go to the liver. They're going to go into the hepatic parenchymal cells, so in the liver, and they undergo schizogony, which is an asexual reproductive process. So they are basically going to make more of themselves um, in the liver. So they're in the liver doing this. After they're completed with that process, those liver cells are going to break down and release out this new stage, merozoids. So that's kind of our new little stage there. That merozoids will travel to your blood then. And then it will get inside your red blood cells. And that's where they're going to, again, make more of themselves. They're going to start to grow and go through stages. They're going to replicate, you know, undergo schizogony, asexual reproduction again. They're going to keep doing this, you know. So the stages that you will see under a microscope with malaria, you'll see a ring form. Then it might go into a late ring or trophozoite stage, and then into what we call a schizon stage that will contain more baby merozoites, and then those merozoites are released again. So that's kind of the order is that it will infect a red cell once it gets in the blood. It will start to basically undergo this asexual reproduction and will become a ring, then a trophozoite, then a schizont that contains new baby merozoites, and then those merozoites rupture the red cell and then go find another red cell. And then they start again, ring form, trophozoite, schizont with more baby merozoites, rupture the red cell, find another red cell. And that whole process just keeps going. So that is where the hemolysis comes in. They're using these red cells to you know, kind of undergo their replication, grow into new stages, and then break down that red cell and go find another red cell. So that's what's happening. When they are actively lysing our red cells, that is when the patient will have fever and chills. So I don't know if you've all heard this before or not, maybe some of you have, but with malaria, it's not a, you know, when you get sick with like say a flu or something, you have a fever the whole time and chills. With malaria, it's a cyclical fever and chills, meaning the patient only experiences the fever and chills anytime the red cells are lysing. When they're not lysing and the merozoites are just kind of replicating and doing its thing, then there's no fever chills. Then they break down the red cell and then the patient gets fever and chills again. So it's a cyclical process. 
and that's kind of one of the key signs of malaria. All right, so while it's doing that, some of the merozoites will form into what we call gametocytes, which can be male and female gametocytes. So now we finally have our sexual stages. So some of them will keep going to other red cells, and then some will become gametocytes, which are these male and female. They are not in the red cells. They hang out just in the plasma on their own. And then when you get bit by another Anopheles mosquito, it will pick up those gametocytes out of the blood. When it sucks your blood, it will pick them up out of there. Inside that mosquito, the male and gametocyte and female gametocyte will have sexual reproduction in the stomach of the mosquito. And then they will make an oocyst, like a baby. They're going to make a baby. That oocyst will go from the stomach, will produce sporozoites, and then those sporozoites will go back to the salivary glands of the mosquito waiting to bite another person to restart the whole process. So that is your life cycle. All right, so to summarize it, your mosquito bites you, injects the sporozoites, they go to your liver, and they undergo schizogony, which is asexual reproduction. They burst the liver cells and then go into the bloodstream. Those merozoites will be inside the red cell, and that's where they undergo the stages of ring, trophozoite, schizont, and then they release more merozoites and break down the red cell and they keep that process going. Some of those will turn into gametocytes, male and female. When a mosquito bites you again, it picks up those gametocytes. They go to the stomach of the mosquito. They make a zygote, which will develop into an oocyst. That oocyst will produce sporozoites, which sit up in the salivary glands, waiting to start again. So those are your steps that you have to know in an order that makes sense on the life cycle of malaria. Now, there is a picture. Sometimes people like pictures. You can find all sorts of information online. There's other images out there. CDC, of course, has a whole spiel on it, whatever works for you. All right, now let's actually discuss a little bit more on the malaria species. So certain malaria species will only infect certain red cells. It's kind of strange that way, but Plasmonium vivax and Plasmonium ovale tend to only target and in, go into younger red blood cells and reticulocytes. So they will actually use those young red cells and reticulocytes to do their, you know, maturation process, growing, burst them, and they go other young red cells. Plasmodium falciparum will infect all, both young and mature red cells. And then Plasmodium malariae infects only the mature, older red blood cells. So they have kind of ones that they target. So when you look at this list and you think, I wonder which one is the most severe, it will, of course, be Plasmonium falciparum, because falciparum will infect all types of red cells. So the infection with falciparum is much more significant than the others. All right, so clinical findings, of course, fever, chills, like I said, in a cyclical pattern, rigor, sweating, headache, kind of the same thing as when you get sick with anything, but it's more cyclical. A hemolytic anemia. Anemia will result with the lysing of those red cells in 25% patients. He, let me put it this way. Hemolysis occurs in all patients that have malaria because it's always breaking down the cell. The part where anemia becomes in is when your bone marrow can't keep up and replace the cells that got destroyed. So in about 25% of patients, this may happen where the hemolysis is too great for the bone marrow to keep up, and then it results in an anemia for the patient. So because it's a hemolysis, you might see some jaundice, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly. Um, you'll see reticulocytosis, shortened red cell survival. So again, the last line tells you hemolysis is greatest in falciparum because, again, that invades red cells at all stages of development. So that's where you probably will get a, more of a hemolytic anemia situation where the bone marrow can't keep up replacing cells. All right, a little bit more on each one specifically. Plasmonium vivax, again, likes to invade the younger red blood cells or reticulocytes. In the ring stage, the way that it looks is that it has a red chromatin dot and a blue staining circle. That's kind of what we call the ring stage. I thought, I wanted to see if I have pictures. Oh, I don't. I'll try to bring up pictures here. Um, let me see here. I think it's sometimes easier if you can see a picture to go with this. Here we go. 
I'm just going to switch over to this other PowerPoint. So that's kind of what a ring stage looks like with the red chromatin dot and then the blue circle there inside the red cell. So that would be your ring stage. And you can see how you see them inside the red blood cell. So the way that we're going to determine if malaria is happening is, well, one, they can do antibody blood tests, but two, we see it under the microscope. When you're in hematology and you're looking at their cells under the microscope, that's why it's always so important to be screening the red cells too, looking at the red cell morphology. So if you were to see something inside the red cell, kind of have to figure out what it is. Is it an inclusion? Is it malaria? You know, like, so you would see this to know that there's a possible malaria happening. All right, so now back to this. All right, so again, it'll have one red chromatin dot. I should be clear with that, and then a blue staining circle. When it grows into the trophozoite stage, it loses the ring shape, and now it basically fills up the entire red blood cell. It's kind of a yellow-brown pigment. The mature schizoids will have 12 to 24 merozoites inside. They look like little dots. There is pictures in your hematology atlas of this, or, of course, there's pictures in your textbook. So look at either one to kind of compare what I'm discussing here. Um, so just in case you're curious what they look like. All right, and then there, the gametocyte stage is going to be more rounded with blue cytoplasm. It has a small chromatin or a larger one, just depending on if it's male or female. Plasmonium ovale is basically going to look very similar to Plasmonium vivax. They both like to invade younger red cells. They look the same in the ring and the trophozoite stage and the gametocyte stage. The only way that ovale and vivax are different is in the chazant stage. So I had said that vivax had 12 to 24 merozoites, whereas ovale has 4 to 8 merozoites. So there's kind of the one difference. Otherwise, you can't tell their stages apart. You just know that it's malaria. And then you would have to probably do antibody tests to figure out which one specifically they had if, they want, if the doctor really wanted to find out. All right, Plasmonium malariae, this is the one that was in older red cells. Same ring stage look. It looks just like the others with the ring stage. This one does have a very characteristic trophozoite stage in that it will be a narrow band across the cell. Instead of the entire trophozoite stage filling up the whole cell, it'll be in a band across the cell. And I have a picture of this right here. So this is the malaria trophozoite. So that wide, well, they call it a narrow band. But normally on trophozoite stage, it will fill up this whole red cell. But in this case, you can see it's banded. It's got you know, right across that rectangular look there. That is unique to just Plasmodium malariae um, trophozoite stage. So that is unique. I would remember that. For the Shazam stage, this one is 8 to 12 merozoites, and then the gametocytes look the same as the others. And then finally, Plasmodium filciparum. This is the one that likes both young and old red cells. This has a unique feature in the ring stage. Most uh, all three of the others had one chromatin dot. Plasmonium falciparum is capable of having up two chromatin dots. So if we, let me just end this real quick. If we go to that slide, this was a picture of Plasmonium falciparum. The others would only have one chromatin dot here. Falciparum can have one or two. So you can see the two here. They kind of look like headphones, right? Like headphones? I think they look like headphones. Um, so that is unique. So I'll the only one can have the two. The others just have one. So I do want you to keep that in mind as well. Otherwise, um, we don't really ever see the um, Shazam stage for falciparum. Trophozoite kind of looks a lot like the others. The gametocyte stage, though, is very unique as well with falciparum in that it is crescent-shaped or you can call it like a sickle shape or a canoe boat shape, whatever you want. This is the gametocyte. So again, the gametocyte is not inside the red cells. The gametocytes, the male and female gametocytes, are inside the plasma just waiting to be picked up. They're not actually in the red cells. So you see how it's that banana or crescent shape, and that is unique. Only Plasmonium falciparum will look like this. None of the others do, so I do want you to remember that one as well. And then again, this is probably the most pathogenic. It is the most 
what they call acute fulminating, so very, very, very severe infection because it can affect all types of red cells. So you get massive hemolysis occurring as a result. So treatment, there are lots of quinine drugs basically are the treatments. I'm not going to worry too much on treatment. You don't have to remember that for us. All right, before we jump to, yeah, no, let's go to Babesia first. Okay. I don't know why it keeps wanting to do this to me. Okay. All right, so Babesia is another one that likes to infect red blood cells and very similar looking to malaria, especially with the ring stages. It also has a ring stage, but Babesia is very much found in the United States. And that is because it is passed by ticks, and it's passed by a certain tick called the Exodes tick. Um, we have this tick in Midwest, in New England area, like Maine, Vermont, things like that. Anywhere that you find this tick, which is a lot of parts of the U.S., you can possibly have Babesia. So when the tick is on you, it can transmit Babesia. It can also be transmitted by transfusion, so they, again, screen blood products now for Babesia as well. So... You will have the malaise, the fever, chills, headaches, myalgia, which is muscle pain, all that. Same thing, but the difference here, it is a straight on um, clinical findings. There's no cyclical finding here. Like in malaria, it was cyclical. Here, it's consistent. You're having these symptoms the entire time they have Babesia. So it will result in a hemolysis as well, which is why we are discussing in this chapter of a hemolytic anemia. So to diagnose it, again, you're going to see it under the microscope inside the red cells, and they will be ring-shaped parasites, or it may be a tetrad form, and that's unique. Only Babesia has a tetrad look to it, and I have a picture here. So they call it a Maltese cross. That's what they call the tetrad form. So it's pointing an arrow there where you can see the four. Otherwise, the other ones just, where's my arrow? I don't know why it's not showing up, but otherwise the other ones are the ring stage. Um, so ring stages look a lot like the malaria stages. So if you were to get somebody's sample, be looking at it under the microscope and see a ring stage in a red cell, I wouldn't say you can tell a difference between malaria babesia. You can't say that yet. What you do is you note it down, tell the doctor you know, on your report, you know, ring stages is noted, possible, I don't know, your your lab will have a, you know, a thing to say. So you're going to indicate to the doctor there might be something here that they're having. The doctor will know upon patient questioning, where have you traveled to? Based on travel, they can figure out if it's going to be malaria or Babesia. If the patient has never left the country, not received a blood transfusion, not had needles, they're not going to have malaria. It's probably Babesia then. But again, they would go to antibody tests, things like that, to narrow down what they have. So just to kind of keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> I'm having troubles with my mouth. I'm sorry. Okay. So again, they can give quinine-type combinations for treatment on this as well. All right, Ehrlichia. Ehrlichia is another one that we do see commonly in the Midwest. This is also transmitted by ticks. It is an intracellular bacteria. So the others are parasites. This is a bacteria. It likes to be only inside cells, and this one targets neutrophils and monocytes. So it's not really targeting the red cells on this one. It's more targeting the neutrophils and monocytes. Again, also can get it through a transfusion. Um, so we would see this detected by seeing question mark is you're going to be detected under the microscope, just like the others. You're going to see it as an inclusion inside the neutrophils and monocytes. So it looks like this little round circular, like I think it stains like a purplish color, inside the neutrophil monocytes. It will definitely not be long. It's not something that's normally seen there. So again, if they think they see it or you think you see something like Ehrlichia, they again can look at antibodies. They could even do PCR as well. They could do PCR on malaria and Babesia as well. Another one, there is um, intravascular hemolysis that can occur due to clustering for fringes. That is an anaerobe bacteria that is just a nasty one, causes um, gas gain green and different things like that. So it definitely, the toxins that can release from that clustering for can put you 
into an intravascular hemolysis. I'm not going to test you on this because we'll learn this more in microbiology. Bartonellosis is also another bacteria called Bartonella bacilliformis, transmitted by a sand fly. Thankfully, we don't have sand flies, so we don't have to worry about this here. But again, it puts it into a hemolytic stage of anemia due to the toxins. I am, you know, just remember, remember these two can also result in hemolysis, but we're not going to go in depth at all on these. And then lots of hemolytic anemias can occur due to different drugs, chemicals, venoms that you're exposed to. So venoms, brown recluse spider, oh my god, nasty, nasty bites. That, I have, I've never experienced it, thankfully, yet, hopefully never. Um, but I know my uncle has been bit by one. He lives in Texas, and oh, he said it was so painful. And I've heard that from many people. It is a very painful bite. Um, so I live in Arizona. It was one of the things I was most afraid of when I moved to Arizona was all the spiders and stuff they have. So um, it's still a fear of mine that it might show up. So anyway, the, the venom that it injects into the body is what results in the huge painful bite, the necrosis kind of ulceration at the site of the bite. So it's really painful and big. It's not a small bite. And then it will result in a hemolysis process because that venom – basically has enzymes that will target and lyse the red cell. So that's what goes on. Same with kind of certain snakes that have different venoms. So all of those can possibly result in hemolytic anemia. And then burns or what we call thermal injuries, third degree burns, of course, will result in severe acute hemolytic anemia. Um, I would think that's probably common sense there. All right, so that is it for this PowerPoint. I do ask that you know the main things I really want you to get out of here is the MAHA stuff. You know all about the MAHA stuff, TTP, HAS, DIC, you know, what we talked about there with the MAHA groups. And then I would know malaria, in and out, know its life cycle, know the t cells that the different four different ones target. Um, and then, and Babesia. Babesia is really important. Ehrlichia is important. So those are some important ones. I also ask for pictures out of this week. I am going to send you this PowerPoint because I don't think I've sent it to you yet. Um, these are the things that I asked. Why is that so big? Here, let me get that smaller. Okay. These are the pictures I ask you to know. I ask you to remember that the plasmonium falciparum ring stage can have up to two chromatin dots. And if you were to see a picture like this, you would be able to identify it as specifically plasmonium falciparum because all the other plasmonians have only one chromatin dot. I also ask that you know the plasmonium falciparum gametocyte stage and that it's that crescent or banana shape. So I want you to be able to identify this. I ask that you identify the plasmodium malariae trophozoite band look, that band strip across the cell, very unique for plasmonium malariae, so be able to identify that. And then lastly, no Babesia, especially that Maltese cross tetrad form. So know that for Babesia. So these are the pictures and things that you should be able to identify. So I will email this out to you as well um, to make sure that you have a copy of this. So that is it kind of for this week. Um, again, if you have any questions at all, please let me know. And have a great week. Thanks, guys.